the, the job of a, of a business owner or someone doing an MBA is to, to be able to have a high level intellectual conversation with every functional area of the business and be the conduit between all of the different functional areas. So they're all working in synergistically with each other and not just kind of siloed off and, and not communicating. Yeah, that probably was almost one of the biggest things I learned to really understanding that's what, that's what my job is. My job is to be able to do that with the different people, and that's what's going to help the business grow the fastest and the most profitable. You're listening to the E-Commerce Influence Podcast with Austin Bronner and Andrew Foxwell. If you want honest, transparent, and tangible results that deliver lasting value and revenue, this is your podcast. With SMS quickly becoming the most important marketing channel of the decade, Many e-commerce brands are excited to get their piece of the pie. But with so many SMS tools popping up, it's hard to know which tool is the best fit for your growing brand. PostScript is a leading SMS marketing platform, laser focused on one thing, building the best SMS platform for e-commerce brands on Shopify. Using PostScript, your team can grow a TCPA compliant subscriber list, use your Shopify data to create targeted text messages campaigns and automations, have two-way conversations with customers, and unlock a brand new marketing channel that drives big time ROI for your store. PostScript is trusted by thousands of growing Shopify and Shopify Plus stores to manage their SMS marketing. Stop treating SMS like email and instead respect the inbox, create hyper segmented campaigns using your data and make your customers happy. Start your free 30 day trial of PostScript today at ecommerceinfluence.com slash PostScript. That's ecommerceinfluence.com slash P-O-S-T-S-C-R-I-P-T. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the E-Commerce Influence Podcast. My name is Austin Bronner, and I'm excited today to bring you an episode with a good friend and a client, Jason Damar. Jason is based in the Gold Coast of Australia. He is a very talented entrepreneur, and today we're going to be talking about his journey, how he went from leading an organization of 50 uh, electricians into running his own e-commerce business that has really taken off. And, um, you know, Jason is a super sharp, quick learner. This guy implements very, very fast. He's also an incredible surfer, which we talk about. He has really inspired me to uh, move faster and think bigger, and he has built this company, Mr. Jones Health, and over the last couple of years, they've really hit an inflection point. They've been growing so fast since kind of late December 2019, early 2020. Uh, they've been on kind of a, a roller coaster uh, of of straight up growth. I would say more of a rocket ship than a roller coaster. And uh, he, he's learned a ton about Facebook. We talk a lot about that. We talk about hiring team and his vision for the future. You know, if you are an operator or someone in the marketing space and you're running your own business, I think you're going to get a lot out of this. So let's welcome Jason to the show. Hey, Austin. Nice to be here. Uh, you know, we get to chat quite often, not in a podcast setting. It always gives me an opportunity to ask questions that I might not ask during one of our calls. So I'm excited to have you here. Thanks for hopping on with me. And, um, you know, to kick things off, I want to ask, which is you mentioned kind of offhand one day that you get towed in to big waves offshore off the coast of Australia. <laughs> and that was just kind of like an offhanded comment. Uh, is how often are you doing that? Yeah, man. How? What does it even look like? What does that feel like? Well, we kind of do it whenever whenever the swells around. It, uh, it doesn't happen here as much as we'd like it to, but there's probably like a handful of good days, maybe like half a dozen good days a year where all the conditions line up and this kind of like remote bombing kind of thing looks like a couple of k's offshore works, and all the guys get out there on their jet skis. You can't really paddle into these waves; they're too far offshore. It's um it's pretty sharky, but it's uh it's a lot of fun, you know. It's um pretty exhilarating. It makes you feel makes you feel alive. I'm sh- I'm sure it does. You know, I I remember getting an email from you talking about how uh w- when we were first starting working together, how excited you were to you know 
grow the business and, and plan a surf trip. And, uh, I was like, that sounds awesome. I didn't know it was, you know, the level of, of surfer that you are. How long have you been surfing and how, how long does it take to get good enough to be able to tow into a wave like that? Um, I've probably been, been surfing since I was about 13 or something. So that's like 20 years now. <laughs> and, uh, I kind of still go whenever I, whenever I can, whenever it's good, like a couple, couple times a week at least. Get up, getting up super early in the morning in the dark and yeah, going to surfing this like kind of national park island from, which is like half an hour from where I live. So like you can't kind of get there just by driving up to the car park. You got to paddle across like a 400 meter seaway, which is like a, um, a channel where all, like all the boats go in and out to the ocean into the harbor, I guess you'd call it. And yeah, you kind of paddle across this, na- this national park and you surf over there and it's probably one of the world's best beach breaks, which is really nice to have so close to home. Absolutely. I mean, I was in, uh, in, in Queensland last January and got to surf a little bit in Noosa and, and I really got a lot better, but I'm still, you know, very, very beginner stages. And, uh, yeah, man, I'm always, I'm always jealous when you're talking about your surfing over there. Outside of the surfing, you, ha- you have a very cool company and you, you know, outside of the getting towed into waves, you've also happened to build a, very fast growing company called Mr. Jones Health. I gave a little intro in the in, in the beginning for our listeners, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about what Mr. Jones Health is and how you actually came up with the idea and got started? I kind of fell into the career that I, that I was in when I came out of school. I, I, was, I became an electrician and kind of got into management of electrical, tra- electrical companies pretty early on. And I was kind of spent like 10 years climbing the, the corporate ladder, so to speak, only to kind of get to the top and be a general manager of a pretty big, like 50 person organization and realize this isn't what I want to do. And this isn't the industry that I want to be in. So that was a kind of like a dawning realization that I, that I made when I was about, I don't know, I think I would have been about 27 or 28 then. Uh, and I started studying my MBA part time, part time, also working full time, just looking for an out of the industry. To, to do something different. And then when I kind of came up, got about halfway through this MBA, my wife and I came up with this idea of, of, of the business to, for Mr. Jones. So we'd spent like good three or four years always brainstorming ideas. We always wanted to go into business together and we, we could just never find the industry that we found. We didn't really find the industry that we wanted straight away. Like we, we sort of drew up plans for cafes to restaurants to, you know, fast, like fast fashion retailers to anything. We didn't really know what we wanted to do. And then um, we had this idea, which kind of stems between like a lot of the things that just, I guess, uh, what our interests aligned with our experience and health and with passion as well and, and making products that they're not, you know, we're not just selling like red sweatshirts or something. We're selling something that has a positive impact on people's lives. That was really important to us. My wife's experience, she spent, she was really lucky. She spent like 10 years or something in two really, really successful e-commerce startups here on the Gold Coast. Um, like she was very early on employee in both of them and helped them both grow to like 30 plus people. She was mainly focused on the operations side, which gave her a really good insight to how an e-commerce business runs, the tech stacks to use and all that type of thing. So she's really, really strong in the operations. Uh, and she didn't really do too much on the marketing side. And that was always going to be my focus is sales and marketing. That's kind of been my passion since day dot. To, to sort of layer all that together, she was kind of going through her own health concerns at the time while she was working as well. She had like a mild case of adrenal fatigue. She had like gluten and dairy intolerances, like a high copper amount, a high copper count in her blood and things like that. She was kind of getting bounced around like the traditional medical system and not really getting the answers that she wanted. Like she was seeing like nat- naturopaths and doctors and dietitians and all types of people and kind of just got kind of feeling like she wasn't getting you know, getting the attention she wanted or getting the the feedback she wanted. So she started really studying health and then that kind of led her to quit her job and start studying neutropathy full time. And she was probably a couple of years into that when she kind of figured out what she needed to do to make herself healthy again. And then we got thinking that there's a lot of overlap between what she was feeling to some degree to what a lot of other people are feeling in, in life just generally, maybe not to like the same level with like the copper, copper in her blood and stuff like that, but there's definitely some overlap with a lot of, cha- with a lot of challenges people face. 
So that kind of stemmed the idea of let's make a health product. Uh, and going into business, there was kind of some prerequisites for me that I wanted to have. Having come from electrical contracting and running those businesses, they're really like heavily regulated by um, corporate, like government bodies and stuff like that. So, you know, electricity is dangerous. So for me, like it had to be heavily regulated because that reduces competition. It had to have like a high capital startup cost, again, because it reduces competition. And it had to be a replenishable item. So what I now know is LTV. Um, it had to, you know, it's it's really hard to acquire a customer in just in business in general, and it's a lot easier to have a long lasting relationship with a few with a fewer amount of people than a one time relationship kind of flash in the pan than than with a lot of people. So that was kind of always the, the prerequisites that I wanted to have, and the, the idea of a of a vitamin business or a health and supplements business really fit into that, and that's kind of where it started. So yeah, we spent about a year or so really diving into the research and researching every ingredient and looking at a, a whole bunch of different scientific studies and trying to piece together what we could think would be a really good product that would help the most amount of people possible that have like a kind of really broad range of health concerns. So it's not like a, a cookie cutter, but it's almost like the product helps, the product that we've ended up pr- creating helps different people in different ways. Like we've got customers that have kind of had really problems with insomnia their whole lives and now they're they're sleeping better. We've also had problems with customers that have had really bad skin conditions their whole lives and now their skin's healthier. So the way that the ingredients kind of work together, it kind of just works in people's bodies and and where they need it most, which has been really, really like the most rewarding thing as the business owner. Like you put all you put all that stuff aside and like I still get so stoked every time I see like just a review come in or like a video, a video testimonial or something come in from a customer saying like how, how great they feel because of, of something that, you know, we've, we've made. And it's, yeah, it's, it's honestly like the thing that keeps you going that it's when, when everything's like, when I get really down sometimes, I go and look at our reviews page and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is, this is why we're doing this. We're actually helping people. Don't, don't beat yourself up. You know, you just got to stay, stay the course, especially right now with our Facebook ads at the moment. For sure. Well, I love the the way how deliberate you guys were around thinking about being heavily regulated, making sure it was replenishable, that there was some high startup capital because those all, you know, reduce competition and allow you to continue to grow maybe more long term. What did you sell the first product and how long did it take to sell your first, you know, a hundred products? We went live on the the first of November twenty seventeen. And my, with my wife's experience, she'd done a lot of stuff with influencer marketing. We're kind of, that was kind of like the, what I sort of see as the tail end of the influencer marketing trend. So we did a lot of that stuff early on. She kind of had some connections that she reached out to. And yeah, we actually, you know, we didn't have the traditional kind of bell curve growth. You hear of all these like high, you know, these startups that, that kind of go through and do like a hundred million in the first couple of years. It was a, it was a really hard slog for the first at least 12 months or so where it was kind of, hot and cold, we were just testing the waters and figuring out how to, you know, deliver a, a sustainable marketing channel. The influencers at the time were getting really expensive. So it was a very high risk, high volatile way of a way of marketing. Like sometimes you'd have a, a an engagement with an influencer and it would just go phenomenally well. And then the same enga- the same influencer does it again a couple of months later and it's crickets. And it was, it wasn't really a sustainable way to, to look at marketing. And that's kind of where I was starting to learn more about Facebook ads. And it got to a point where we were more consistent on Facebook ads than we were with influencers. So we kind of just focused on what was providing the most stable results and, and kind of doubled down on that and went away from that influencer side of things. Um, so how long did it take us to get to our first thousand customers? Probably about six months or something, I'd say. Yeah, well, that's, that's a, a incredible learning time, right? Over those first thousand customers, like you were talking about doing it, testing different things, testing different channels, and then getting a little bit of traction on Facebook ads. Then sure enough, finding that that is kind of the channel where you're able to have repeatable success. I think you, know, you are one of the most intuitive Facebook advertisers that I know, right? You can kind of go through and look at things. And when I, every time I t- talk to you, I am struck by how you've got a good feel 
for the customer and a good feel for what they need and what they, you know, how to market to them. How did you learn to get that feel for the customer? How did you, how did you actually learn to do Facebook advertising as well as you, you do it today? Facebook advertising is a challenge. There's people get so caught up in like looking back to what I know now, people get so caught up in the tactics of like, you've got to run this audience and this CBO thing with this budget or a big cap and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, that stuff works. But I think what's often overlooked by most Facebook advertisers is the human element. Like on the other side of that device, there's a human, there's a person that is going through something in their life. And that's, that's kind of where our marketing channel, our marketing strategy differs is trying to focus on, on that, on that human element and kind of reverse engineer what they're feeling at, at that point in time and trying to talk to that pain point. And if that pain point, we only talk to pain points where our, where our products offer like an actual benefit. So we're not trying to, we're just trying to do that, you know, typical solution selling, I guess, kind of what I used to do in trades is you'd find where, where someone's problem is and you'd, you'd provide them with a solution. It doesn't matter whether they buy your product or not, but at least now they, at least then now they know that, well, that option's there to them. Um, so you have to kind of balance the, the tactics of how to buy media in Facebook with the human element of the creative. We focus, pride ourselves on being, um, a very customer centric business where we put the customer first in everything that we do and every thought that we do kind of, it's almost, I, I feel it's almost sometimes a detriment to our short term success. Just trying to think like long term about the customer and thinking we don't want to sort of get drawn into doing things short term, which might create like an influx of revenue in the detriment to losing the lifetime value of a subscriber or, or from a, from a customer because we like people buy from brands not just because of the product, but also because of their morals and their values. And I think that by having strong morals and values and beliefs and pushing that across into your advertising and, and your overall marketing and messaging is what resonates and builds a, a loyal fan base of, of like-minded people. You would mentioned earlier about the reviews and how you go there and you look at the reviews and that's a place you can kind of generate energy from because you see that you're helping people. And it's, it's, it's fascinating looking at your marketing and seeing how that's entirely reflected, right? So the reviews all feed into kind of more of the top of the funnel and the reviews attract the really positive feedback that you get from customers is what helps you attract more customers, right? That's like that kind of that flywheel effect. I love what you're talking. I love what you said about. Uh, thinking about the customer and being customer centric. I was watching a Jeff Bezos documentary and an Amazon Jeff Bezos documentary. And one of the things they talk about was at all their meetings, they have an extra empty chair and that empty chair is for the customer. And so it reminds them that they need to keep the customer in every single conversation that they have, because that is a very, very, the most important part of the business. What practices have you used to get more connected to your customer? The word that springs to mind there is, is empathy and just being really empathetic towards what that customer is going through and just trying to, you know, think really deeply about what they're doing in their lives. Shift workers, for example, that's one of our, one of our core groups of customers. Like our product really helps people that are in, in, in shift work with, with changing rosters and stuff like that because their sleep patterns are disrupted. I've got a two and a half year old child now that um, is a terrible, terrible sleeper. And I know firsthand what a bad night's sleep does to your mental space the next day, especially when you compound that for two and a half years, which has <laughs> kind of been our journey. So I kind of, yeah, having the empathy to, to be able to understand what it feels like and just be, trying to be able to think about how that, how that person's feeling on the other end of it and really talk to that because that's, that's kind of like, what they're, what they're out to, what they're out to overcome, whether they know it or not. People don't go on Facebook and Instagram to buy products. A really good analogy I heard somewhere along the way was Facebook and Instagram is like going to a party. And no one likes going to a party and meeting someone when all they do is talk about themselves. You know, the used car salesman stuff. They're like, oh, get, get me away from this guy. You kind of want to have like a bit of two way communication with, with the customers and like, Opening, opening a loop so they're more interested in, in the thing that you've got. And the best way to do that is, hey, have, meet my friend, 
Mr. Jones, they're really great because they've helped me, dot, dot, dot. Like, you know, fill in the blank there. And like a lack of sleep is one of uh, like a, the sleep benefit of our products is so universal across so many different different customer groups. Like like what I just said earlier with like mums with young children, they're up and down all night. They have really bad night sleeps. Dads as well, but I'm very much in that space, and that's definitely been another really strong customer group that we that we market towards because our, our product has benefits there. I think it's a great tip to to have empathy and really lean into what the customers customers need. I want to touch back on something you mentioned earlier, which is so it took about six months to hit your first thousand customers, and you were talking about you know you didn't have the out the gate parabolic growth that a lot that some other companies that are more like notable have had, but you guys have had really, really strong growth. When did you feel like the momentum kind of hit? How long did that take? And when you started to feel like, oh, wow, like this is starting, we're starting to really move here and grow at a pace that is even more than we expected. De- December 2019. So that's like over two years since we first started. The first kind of two years was like constantly being punched in the face. And I think to go out and start your own business, you have to kind of expect that and enjoy it somewhat. Um, there would have been like in that first couple of years, so many times when I wanted to quit and I wanted to just give it all up and go and do something else. But the, the problem was we'd kind of thrown our, our life savings into starting the business and there was no other way. It was like jumping out of a plane and building a parachute on the way down. We didn't have like a safety chute to go and do something, to go and do something else. It's like, this has to work. Uh, we're new parents with a, with a baby because we, we started a family at the same time we started our business. Something I, I definitely wouldn't recommend, but yeah, um, 2017 and this December 2019 is really when everything's kind of clicked into gear and looking back on it now, I can't put that down to one thing, but more a, the sum of all the things that we were doing right. And just, you know, Getting, getting better on email, getting better at top of funnel, getting better at our mid funnel, getting better on our messaging and, and all that type of stuff. It's just like all these little incremental changes adding up to what is kind of like more, be a bigger, more scalable result. And it's, that's another thing I've always been focused on is trying to build something that's like scalable and structurable where it's not always going to have to be me doing it. So trying to, trying to build something in a systematic way rather than just like shooting with a musket and hoping and hoping for the best. Um, and yeah, doubling down on that and kind of once we found a pattern that worked, elaborating on that and horizontally scaling to different groups of people so that instead of focusing on, you know, ads that are kind of like, hey, come and buy my shit, look, look how good our product is, we're focusing on different customer groups. And now we've got six different customer groups, which our one product helps and we can scale towards those six different customer groups kind of infinitely because the language and the marketing opportunities that we can pursue for those different groups of people is, is very different. And you wouldn't get the same amount of scale if you were just sort of product centric than you are if you're customer centric. And I think having that, that shift of, or having uncovering that learning late December last, in December last year has kind of been what's been the catalyst to our growth. And we've, I think look, I looked at I looked back at it not too long ago, and I think we've grown something like 800% since December last year. So in that time, we've hired um, three new people. Um, we outsourced um, the media buying from me to uh, another to like a kind of boutique agency over in the states with one of your recommendations. And yeah, we're starting to advertise on Google a bit more. We're now hiring for a couple of new roles to to really kind of grow the business and and. Ideally, just kind of get the business where it's it's like what I was kind of going to before, like a self-generating machine where I'm not involved in the daily operations, but I'm sort of more involved at, on the taking the the big steps that are going to make the biz, the business ta- the, allow the business to take big leaps, rather than the the daily business as usual grind. Yeah, I think what, one of the things I've noticed about working with you is is that you implement very quickly and you. Uh, you know, if you've got something in mind, it's really impressive. You can take it, move it forward. And whether that's been hiring or uh, getting something off of your plate that has been taking up a bunch of your time and doesn't necessarily like 
serve you, you move very quickly. What's been the biggest mindset shift that you've had over, let's say, the last six, eight months as you've been navigating the growth that the business has had and you've been hiring a bunch of people? Coming to the realization that I was the bottleneck to growth. I personally was the person who sort of, you know, drove the growth initially, but then I'm, yeah, the limitation to that going forward and understanding that if I'm doing, you know, media buying and Facebook ads and creative and copywriting, that's not the best, highest use of my time. Um, and that I need to be able to build a team of people to support the business where that stuff, that business as usual stuff that has to happen can happen without me and really focusing on what we want the team culture to be so that, you know, I've led and been a part of organizations where it's a very top down management approach, um, where it's very much employees versus management. And I hated being a part of that. And I don't want to build a company that sort of anywhere near, anywhere near resembles that. I want to build a company where people like coming to work and they enjoy what they do and they feel rewarded for doing it, both, you know, financially and personally, and because they believe in the mission and we're doing things that, that help people. I could tell that's, that's one of the things you've talked about is just your experience from being in the trades to shifting over to an online business. It's a little bit different, right? It's your in-person versus remote, uh, at least right now, especially your remote. What, what's been the hardest part for you about building Mr. Jones? Initially, not having a, a, a background to leverage that, that, that resonates to what we're doing now. So, like, when, you, when you're an electrician and then you hire a graphic designer to do something and they present something that doesn't look good, to then not being able to communicate to that person in their language to give them constructive criticism. You can't just turn around and say, I'll oh, go and make that better. So, for me... I really had to focus for those first couple of years of learning the language of what this industry entails. So being able to talk to a graphic designer in a way that, that they understand, oh, let's adjust this line weight or let's change the perspective of this image or let's ch- change this, this here. So being really like being able to have like a really high level conversation with all of the areas of the business has kind of been the biggest challenge and that's kind of where we I feel like we're in a good place now because I've done that groundwork and I can have those you know intellectual high level conversations with people I don't necessarily need to know how to move the pixels around in Photoshop but I can surely have a, a good conversation with someone that does and, that, and they understand it and then they appreciate that as well because there's nothing more frustrating on their side than to go oh he just wants me to fix it again I don't know what to do and <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just being being able to give constructive criticism because, um, yeah, you you need to be pretty well educated to be able to do that kind of stuff. Well, it, it's funny you mention that because that that this was the most challenging thing for uh, when I was when we were building our house. So, our contractor and my wife, they both speak English, but they don't speak the same language at all. Right. So he she would have something in her mind and how she wanted just like when you're talking about like the learning the language of the industry and like you knew the language of, of to speak to another electrician. She would try to speak to the contractor and she would, you know, to be describing what she wants. And then he, he would come back and be like, yeah, we could do that. We can, you know, knock this out here, put in a beam and, you know, Describe it in the most construction term possible, and she would just be like, "I don't know what you just said." <laughs> <laughs> and so I would find myself in this in this middle range where I knew a little bit more than she did about the language of construction. Uh, so I would be communicate. I would be translating between the two of them to to get the house built, and uh, it's so spot on. It's so true. Like having to know that. It, like the, the the language of the industry is a big learning curve for sure. That's really interesting to hear that that that's been the most challenging for you. Yeah, one of my law lecturers at uni said that when I was doing my MBA that the 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 job of a, of a business owner or someone doing an MBA is to to be able to have a high level intellectual conversation with every functional area of the business and be the conduit between all of the different functional areas. So they're all 
working in synergistically with each other and not just kind of siloed off and, and not communicating. Yeah, that probably was almost one of the biggest things I learned to really understanding that's what that's what my job is. My job is to be able to do that with the different people and that's what's going to help the business grow the fastest and the most so the most profitability most profitably. Well, back to what you said also about you know re- recognizing that it being in the copywriting in the creation of Facebook ads while that was incredibly valuable for you early on and like you were leading the growth at a certain point you became the bottleneck. I mean, back to like I said I've been on like a Jeff Bezos kick like listening to all his recordings. He he brought up something that was so interesting. He he's like I like to I like to live. He said I got the best job in the world because I got to live 3 years in the future. 3 to 5 years in the future. I'm always in the future, but he's like my job is to be 3 to 5 years in the future. And if I'm in the present, that means Something's wrong. And I thought it was a really good takeaway, a good way to explain like the role of the founder as you grow and you get bigger and you've got a team. If you're not in the present, that means you can work on the future. And the only way to get to the future is by building systems to allow the present to operate and for you to continue to grow without you being involved with it. That's super, super interesting. Um, as you've gone on this journey, right, and you've continued to to grow as a as a leader and a founder, w- what are some of the best resources that have helped you on your way uh, to becoming a um, you know a, a marketing force and a uh, the leader of your organization? I guess the biggest resources that have helped me along my journey are. Listening to listening to podcasts all the time, staying up to date with like the latest Facebook tra- Facebook tactics and stuff like that. Um, coming across your podcast has been really great, and that isn't sort of so siloed into you know Facebook alone, but it's more business health in general and different ways to think about things. Um, also, having listened to hundreds and hundreds of different business best-selling business audio books, it's like I've got a highlight reel of things in my head, and you know. One of all of the different things come into play. Like I think, um, yeah, there's that quote of you. You want to be the the leader of a business that's the dumbest person in the room because if you're the smartest person in the room, there's a problem. Um, that's that specifically rung true to me recently as we've been growing. I don't want to be the leader telling everyone what, everyone what to do. I want to be the business owner where the organization is kind of running itself and I'm putting my stamp on it at the end. Almost just, you know, like we said earlier, just really taking into account how the customer is going to feel and all that other stuff can kind of just happen. Um, some really good books that have, have helped me is Traction by Gino Whitcomb. That was a, that was a really good one and the entrepreneurial operating system. Um, the Lean Startup by Eric Weiss, you know, the typical ones with the seven habits of highly effective people, Emith Revisited. There's, yeah, all of those classics. That's, they're, they're, a, that's a great, yeah. All those classic books, you can keep rereading them and you learn more every single time. Absolutely. Right. Depending on where you're at, it's like they're so, they're so good. They've been around for so long because when you reread them, you get something different because you're a different part in your journey. And, um, that's, that's, that's awesome. And, and I mean, the part of the journey you're in right now is one of the big things you're, you're looking at is hiring. Right in building your team, um, do you, can you talk a little bit about like where you're going with the vision for the company and what roles you're hiring for? Absolutely. So, 2020 for us is kind of been focusing on building the infrastructure that can deliver the scale that we want to be doing for the next couple of years, and really working out our, our systems and processes and, and tech stack and working things out so that we're doing things, we're growing effectively and efficiently. Um, we've now got an opportunity to sort of launch our products into three new markets into 2020, in 2021 with the US, uh, the UK and Canada, kind of al- almost simultaneously, if you will, which is a really, really exciting opportunity. Um, to do that, it's not going to happen with me being as involved in the day to day. Like I really loved your analogy earlier of being in the future and to grow the business forward. That's definitely what I need to be doing. Um, so to right now to, to help the business grow, we need to be hiring a, a bunch of people. So we're looking for a head of growth that can focus 
primarily focus on CPA. Like their their entire their entire entire focus and role will be to how can we acquire acquire the most amount of customers with, with our marketing budget and with with our ad spend across all the different digital channels, not just Facebook. And we we want to kind of build a, a pod or a team of people in the growth in the growth team. So we'll, that will probably consist of a of a copywriter, uh, a a designer, a media buyer, and a, a, a marketing assistant in that kind of team. And also in parallel to that, we want to be building like a retention team. So someone that's really, really strong on email and they will have another designer and another copywriter and another assistant. And I think with those two teams running in parallel, one, one team focusing on growth and driving the business forward with maximizing the opportunities that we've got and another team focused on retention and providing content to our audience that keeps them interested, then that's kind of the flywheel of what um, is going to allow business the business to grow forward. And, and my job will be developing new products. Um, we've got a really, really exciting pipeline of, of new products for the next couple of years, which I think will give us the business, give us the opportunity to really, really expand um, as we grow forward. And not we're not sort of just sticking within the realms of a vitamin business. We're like, uh, women's health products. So we're going outside of vitamins and going into a bunch of other different verticals that are still under that umbrella of like women's health and self-care products. Um, so that kind of is another differentiating point in the marketplace of where we'll kind of sit. Oh, that's awesome. I, I, you, every time we talk, you come up with a new idea of how you can build the business, like either bigger or wider. What I mean by that is like usually have ideas to grow Mr. Jones further. And then also I say wider to add different brands into this ecosystem, continue to do what you're doing so well. I'm, I'm really, really excited about uh, where you're going and uh, it's just fun to, to watch. What's one thing that you wish you'd known before starting Mr. Jones? Well, if I was a, if I was like world class in Facebook ads when we started, that would have helped. Um, <laughs> when we started off, I, I didn't know what a Facebook ad was. You know, I was spending like five dollars a day going, what, what's a pixel? What's a conversion event? Like, I literally knew nothing, and I had to learn everything from the ground up by by the school of hard knocks of just going in there and blowing stuff and going, oh, that didn't work. Oh, that that kind of worked. What's what's that mean? And trying to really figure it all out to now. You know, spending six figures a month on Facebook. It's, it's been a really, really, really steep learning curve. Um, so I guess in, in a perfect world, having, having experience in that prior to starting a business would have been great. But the biggest thing I'd say to myself is to, you know, I think every business, go, every business owner, um, has this kind of, this kind of feeling is to not get so caught up in the short term. Like things are going to fluctuate. Just stay on course with, with the strategy and the journey because, Business isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. And I think it's really easy to get caught up in the thick of thing things and trying to meet a deadline or a target or a budget or something like that when, you know, it's ultimately just a blip in the radar when you're looking at, looking at it from a wider, like, you know, 10 year lens. If you have a bad quarter, then it's just a bad quarter. It's just a good, it's an opportunity for growth and learning. Sure. Sure. Well, if somebody's interested, this has been this has been awesome, and just going through your your journey. If someone's interested in those roles or wants to come on board, or you know, reach out to you, and what's the best way for them to get connected with some of the roles that you're hiring for, or get, get connected with you? I just realized that we didn't talk about the email copywriter person. So you can talk about it right now. Uh, so yeah, the other role that we're we're really actively hiring for now, other than the head of growth, is uh, like an email expert and conversion focused copywriter. And their role is going to be to own our retention metrics and come on and, and lead a team of people to deliver really, really valuable content through channels like email and blogs and stuff like that. To Once the acquisition team is bringing customers in, their job is to keep them interested in, in the brands and with different products. And, yeah, someone that can, that's really – that understands – what a business needs to do to survive and, and make sales, but also how to provide value to its audience. So we're not just running, you know, flash sale after flash sale. We're actually providing really valuable content that our, our audience can read and whether they buy our products or not, they, they actually take something away from it and go, that was, that was really useful and that, that's improved their lives. So someone that can understand that and run that balance. 
I'll, I'll jump in and, and talk it up. You guys do a great job on email, email marketing and, and providing massive value. And if somebody's not, if somebody's, if that's something somebody wants to hop in and, and, and really take over. It's, it's a great role. Do you guys have a, like a careers page or what's the best way to get connected to somebody? Cause you yeah, are so again, actively hiring. We've just built a careers page out on our website, uh, which kind of talks about our brand morals and values and stuff on that front page. And inside that, there's, there'll be links to the different roles that we're hiring for. So keeping an eye on that and on our Instagram page is where we'll advertise that type of stuff just organically as well. Is that careers? Yeah, that's our careers page. So if you, <laughs> we can put the URL in the, uh, we'll put the URL in the show notes. Jason, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you hopping on here and chatting with us and sharing your journey. It's super fun working with you. And yeah, man, I will talk to you very soon. Great, man. It was a lot of fun. Hey, guys, it's Austin. And if you've been loving the podcast, you got to go check out brandgrowthexperts.com. That's where I work one-on-one with my clients to help them build faster growing, more profitable online stores. I've got coaching programs and workshops that we host all over the world. Would love to have you come check it out. If you're a fast growing e-commerce business or you want to be a fast growing e-commerce business, you got to check it out. That's the spot for you. We go more in depth than we do in the podcast with comprehensive trainings and coaching to help you scale up. Check it out. Brandgrowthexperts.com. See you there.